God is an awesome God. God. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, welcome to prayer school. It's day seven already. Can you believe it? <laughs> Before you say Jack Robinson, it will be day 28. Amen. I welcome you warmly in Jesus' name. I want to go right in, right in quickly. Take your Bible. Go with me to Luke chapter 11 verse 1. This is going to be our foundation scripture for the Wednesdays in this month. Luke 11, 1, you recognize we're pursuing one theme on Sunday, one theme on Wednesday, and one theme on Friday. And we're going to see how the Holy Ghost is going to bring it all together because our God is concerned about every part of your life, every part of your being. Our God is a whole God. He's a wholesome God. The Lord your God is one God. Hallelujah. Have you found Luke 11 verse 1? Put your Bible ribbon there because you're going to go to it over and over. Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place. When he sees that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples. Place your anointing on the teaching and the hearing of your word tonight. And let there go forth with the word, the anointing for its own activation and fulfillment in our lives. Electrify this atmosphere with your power. Charge it with your presence. Lord, involve every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. Let there be no spectators tonight. Let there be no stragglers tonight. And let the glory, honor, and praise return to you. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Help me preach tonight. Lift your hand and say, Lord, teach us to pray. Ladies and gentlemen, God has called us to be a people of power. Oh, you didn't hear. I said God has called us to be a people of power. We are not designed to be weaklings. We are not designed to be wimps. The Bible says the people that know their God shall be strong and they shall do great exploits. Listen to me tonight. When you do what other people do, that's not an exploit. When you go to work and you put in a day's work and you finish and you say it's all in a day's work, that's not an exploit. When you pay your rent at the end of the month, like every other person pays their rent, that's not an exploit. When you are able to achieve the things that people like you achieve, and they say no wonder we understand after all he's got an MBA this is what people who have an MBA do that is not an exploit an exploit is when you achieve extraordinary feats when you do things that amaze people, that perplex them, that overwhelm them and flabbergast them, or should I say overgast and flabberwhelm them. When you do marvelous things, when you do great and mighty things, when you do things that echo in the minds of men, when you do things that cause people's eyes to pop and their jaws to drop, then you are performing exploits. And if you know your God, that is your portion. We are called to be a people of power. Say power. We are also called to be a people of influence. We are not supposed to pass through this world hanging on by the skin of our teeth. Trying to prevent ourselves from being polluted by a corrupt and sinful world. Have you seen that picture of three monkeys? One covering its eyes, one covering its ears, and one covering its mouth. That's the way many believers go through life. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Lord, protect me. Come Lord Jesus, take me out of this sinful world. That's not who you're called to be. We are not supposed to be on the sidelines. It's a shame that we've allowed ourselves to be pushed from our position. We are center stage people. 
Ha! Ah, you are not hearing me tonight. We are saying you are the light of the world. The light gives light to everything. It influences the atmosphere of the room. You are the salt of the earth. Salt changes everything. We are called not just to be a people of power. We are called to be a people of influence. We are supposed to say that's the way it's supposed to be and it goes that way. We are supposed to say that's not right and everybody stands at attention. The things we allow are allowed. The things we disallow are disallowed. We are supposed to be the ones they consult before they make decisions. Ah, you're not hearing me. I was reading the newspaper the other day and I heard that Cherie Blair has a personal psychic or had. They fought now. She had a personal psychic. And sometimes when things are tough in the government, she will begin to send faxes, 50-page faxes to the psychic to get counsel and direction for where her husband is supposed to take the government. And people in number 10 will shake their head in disbelief. Now listen closely to me. It's because we have not taken our position that people like that have any say whatsoever in how our governments are being run. In the days of Samuel, they consulted him before they made a decision. In the days of Elisha, he said to the king, tell that Syrian general to come and he will know that there is a God in Israel. That's the way it's supposed to be. Are you hearing me? We're supposed to be people of power. Say power. We're supposed to be people of influence. Say influence. Go with me in your Bible to Genesis 39 and verse 3 Genesis chapter 39 and verse 3 I beg your pardon that should be Genesis 49 that should be Genesis 49 you know how you open one place and you write down another Reuben you are my firstborn how many of you know that we are called God's firstborn my might and the beginning of my strength let me tell you what that means that means if you want to know how strong I am, look at my son. If you want to know how powerful our God is, look at his children. You are my firstborn, God says. You are my might. You are the beginning of my strength. The excellency of dignity, say dignity. And the excellency of power, say power. The excellency of dignity is the manifestation of your priestly office. The excellence of your power is the manifestation of your kingly office. The excellence of dignity gives you influence. The excellence of power, of course, gives you power. Say influence, say power, say dignity, say power. We have been called to be kings and priests unto our God. Notice what I said kings and priests not kings or priests it's not either or it's both and i know some people have taught in the church that some of us are kings and some of us are priests and the kings go get the money and the priests bring the blessing and there's a sense in which that is true and i don't want to take away from that but let's not forget what the bible says we are kings say kings and priests you are a king, you are a priest. I am a king, I am a priest. Hallelujah. Go now to Revelation chapter 5. It's okay to turn back and forth like that. We go from Genesis and then we go to Revelation. Very, very good. I mean, in one service, you can tell everybody you read the whole Bible. <laughs> Genesis 5, Revelation, I beg your pardon, 5 verses 9 and 10. And they sang a new song saying, God will put a new song in your mouth this month. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings, say kings, and priests, say priests, to our God and we shall reign on the earth. As kings, we exercise power. As priests, we exercise influence. In the king, the power is directed downward. Say downward. Now, I'm adding a new dimension now. Pay attention. In the priest, the influence is directed upward. Say upward. Hallelujah. But I have discovered, ladies and gentlemen, that we cannot function effectively as kings 
until we know how to function effectively as priests. The downward direction of our power, the ability to control and influence circumstances and to command situations and take territories and to win battles will not be fully available to us until we have learned to stand in our office as priests. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 24 and 25. It talks about Jesus, both in his kingly position and in his priestly position. Look at it with me. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since, since he always lives to make intercession for us. Notice, the reason he is able to save to the uttermost is that he lives to make intercession. Did you get it? Did you get it? He saves to the uttermost. He stands in his office as king. Because he makes intercession, because he stands in his office as a priest. Did you catch that? The truth is we cannot truly know how to prevail with men if we have not first learned how to prevail with God. Prayer, ladies and gentlemen, is the foundation for everything else we do as children of God. Prayer is not one of the things you do as part of your Christianity. Prayer is at the core, at the center of your faith. Are you hearing me today? If we don't get it right in prayer, we cannot get it right anywhere else. This is our source. This is our root. This is our foundation. This is our strength. As believers, individuals, as a church, a corporate body, we will not be able to function in the fullness of the power that is available to us until we get this prayer thing right. And I have deliberately decided to take this entire month to focus and teach on prayer because I am not so naive or presumptuous as to think that because you come to prayer meeting, you know about prayer. Or because when I say let us pray, everybody opens their mouth and now something is coming out. That you understand prayer. Are you hearing me today? All of the power of the kingdom of God is at our disposal. It is sitting. It is waiting to be commandeered. It is waiting for us to claim it. And prayer is the key that unlocks that power. Everything that makes God God. Hear me. Everything that makes God God is available to you and to me. No, you didn't catch it. Think about it. The things that separate him as God, they are available to us. And we make the connection through our prayer. How many of you here will agree with me that there are places that we cannot go, but God can go? Things we don't know that God knows. People we cannot touch that God can touch. Issues we cannot influence that God can influence. Things we cannot do that God can do. How many people agree with me? Now listen closely. Whatever God can do, your prayer can do. Wherever God can go, your prayer can go. Whoever God can touch, your prayer can touch. Whatever God can affect or influence or change, your prayer can affect or influence or change. So you are no longer limited if you understand this key called prayer. Somebody say, Lord, teach us to pray. This is how much influence and how much power your prayer can wield. When you realize this, when you realize that this is how much really, how much power there is in prayer, then prayer will no longer be a chore for you. It will no longer be just the fulfillment of your Christian duty. It will become the core activity of your Christian life. It will become your primary occupation. And then you will truly yearn 
for someone to teach you how to pray. Say with me, say, Lord, teach us to pray. Let's go back to Luke 11, 1. The disciples observed Jesus praying. <laughs> and they knew that there was something about his prayer that unlocked the power of God. It may even be that they felt something in the atmosphere where Jesus prayed. It may be that they saw something. Maybe there was something about his countenance, about his persona that gripped their attention. I remember I used to live in a shared house many, many, many years ago. And when I would get in my room and I would start to pray, one of my flatmates would come and kneel at the door of my room. There was just something coming out of that place at that time. He just said to himself, if I just kneel here, maybe I'll get some blessing. I have a feeling there was something that happened when Jesus prayed that gripped the attention of the disciples. Notice the Bible didn't say he was praying with them. He was praying and they watched him. Somehow they were able to establish a connection between his success in public life and his diligence in private life. So they asked him. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. Say it with me, Lord, teach us to pray. I want you to see four key elements of this very simple request. And this will be our foundation. Number one, the first emphasis is on the word Lord. Lord, teach us to pray. If there is anybody we want to learn about prayer from, it is from you. I want you to notice the two verbs in that request. Teach, say teach. And pray, say pray. Pray. Nobody could teach like Jesus could. Would you agree with me? Nobody could pray like Jesus could. Would you agree with me? How many of you know that not every good coach is a good player? How many of you know there are some people who play very well, but they can't teach others to play like them? So when you get a combination of a good coach and a good player, you are on to a winner. Who knows what I'm talking about? 